ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله الحمد لله we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one and the unique. We worship Him alone and it is, is His aid that we seek. He is the Lord of the oppressed and He answers the dua of the weak. Brothers and sisters, today inshaAllah ta'ala, we have one question that I have been asked by many, many people, but uh, I'm answering it today. And I will actually choose a, a particular uh, questioner uh, that uh, came with this specific question. Brother Sajid from Australia emails, and uh, mashallah Barakal, he's in high school, he's a teenager, and he's learning about Islam, and he says that uh, he has come across the fact that there are uh, two different masjids in his locality. One of them is a Sunni masjid, one is a Shi'i masjid, a Shi'ite masjid. And he says that this has now caused him confusion because he felt that Islam was for unity, that all of the Muslims are one, but he is aware of uh, the fact that even in his own hometown, uh, somewhere in Australia, that uh, there are different masajid and he's now asking that, well, how do we understand this? And also, he asks me to explain uh, what is the difference between uh, these two groups and what should we do about it? Now, obviously, this is a very, very difficult question. And to my dear brother Sajid, I will say that uh, the answer is actually quite complicated, but I will try to address uh, this question in a manner that is satisfactory uh, uh, to you insha'Allah ta'ala. Uh, to those others in the audience who might be uh, more mature or more knowledgeable, please understand that there is a time and a place uh, and a particular language for when to be used. And our brother Sajid is a teenager. Similarly, perhaps a new Muslim uh, or perhaps somebody who is unaware of these things, that there is a language and a methodology to teach these very, very sensitive topics. And uh, inshallah ta'ala, this is a very basic level response that should be sufficient for those that are uh, new to this reality or those that are young or those that are not involved in the uh, intra-Muslim issues or affairs. They need to be told an answer that is sufficient uh, for them and uh, uh, other avenues exist for more detailed uh, discussions. Sadly, the fact of the matter is that this question is already a tense question because most of us are well aware that there is quite a lot of animosity and uh, tensions between these two segments of the Muslim Ummah. And there are people who like to fan the fuel of hatred. Look where that has gotten us across the globe. From my side, uh, I am completely against exacerbating tensions and I'm all for factual academic teaching. So today, inshallah, I will try to demonstrate that by walking into this landmine of a question and by explaining in a manner that inshallah, whoever listens to this answer will not be able to criticize any fact that is said, to be fair and to be unbiased and then to let the uh, facts speak for themselves. To answer our young brother Sajid's question, he is saying that isn't uh, the Muslim Ummah one and shouldn't we be unified? And the response is that indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does say in the Quran, وَإِنَّ هَذِهِ أُمَّتُكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا وَأَنَ رَبُّكُمْ فَاعْبُدُونَ This is your ummah, it is one ummah, and I am your Lord, so worship me. And Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً All of the believers, they are brothers, they are brothers together. All of the believers are brothers. This is the ideal, this is the aspiration. This does not negate the reality. And the reality is that that ideal is sometimes not met and that there shall be differences and tensions and different understandings of realities and of truths and even of faith. Allah says in the Quran, كَانَ النَّاسُ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا Mankind used to be one united ummah and then they differed. And because they differed, فَبَعَثَ اللَّهُ النَّبِيِّينَ بُوَشِرِينَ وَمُنْذِرِينَ Allah then had to send prophets to teach and to give glad tidings, to warn, to re relay the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَجَعَلَكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا If Allah had willed, He could have made all of mankind in one nation. 
If Allah had willed a different reality, that would have been the case. But that is not the case. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ لَجَعَلَ النَّاسَ أُمَّةً وَاحِدَةً وَلَا يَزَالُونَ مُخْتَلِفِينَ If Allah had willed, all of mankind would be one, but they shall remain disunited. وَلَا يَزَالُونَ مُخْتَلِفِينَ إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمَ رَبُّكَ Except those whom Allah has shown mercy on, that they shall be united. So Allah is saying that mankind as a rule differs amongst themselves. And you know, my dear brother Sajid and all of you out there, we see this reality in every single aspect of life. You say that you are in high school, a teenager. Don't you sometimes play with your friends that you like and then maybe even your brothers and siblings and then you disagree? Sometimes those disagreements become very, very bitter. Astaghfirullah, sometimes they might even go more than just words even though they shouldn't. Misunderstandings occur. Some people have different ways of looking at the same thing. They have different priorities in life. Some people, they understand realities differently. And this is the way that Allah created mankind. Not everybody has the same angle, the same lens, the same perception, the same analysis, the same list of priorities. And the closer you are to somebody, and the more you have in common with them, the more difficult the differences are. And that is why if a stranger differs with you, it's not a big deal. But when your brother differs with you, it really hurts. And so when we have two groups of the ummah who are our brothers, when they differ, sometimes that difference is really difficult for us because we're so close and yet still. So this is a reality of existence that people differ. And we have to also point out that some differences of opinion are actually healthy and encouraged. To a certain degree, it's good that your flavor of ice cream that you like is, is different than my flavor and your brother's flavor. We don't want everybody to have the exact same flavor. Some diversity is good. And even in, for example, the fiqh schools, the laws, the Islamic fiqh, we have different positions. Usually, typically, those positions are healthy difference of opinion. It is good the Sahaba themselves differed over specific areas of Islamic law. and. It is said that, you know, a number of them said, this difference of opinion is a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes the differences of opinion are not desirable and we don't like them, but we need to just tolerate and live and let live even if we don't like. And this is the reality of the differences that you are asking about between these two large groups of the ummah. So it is a reality that there are two large strands and it is not something that we like that this exists, but it is there. And we simply have to tolerate and accept that there are people that view the world and view Islamic uh, theology differently than us and understand that their worldview is different than our worldview. Now you asked me to summarize that what is the, uh, what are the main differences? And again, this is something that uh, much can be said. And actually this is one of my areas of, of expertise, which is Islamic theology and the development of Islamic theology. But to summarize to a level that is inshallah useful uh, for you to know, I'll summarize in 10 key points, 10 key differences uh, that uh, inshallah ta'ala are factually correct, academically uh, sound and ask Allah to guide me in this. We have to be fair and accurate and we have to quote uh, the reality of what people believe without distortion, without manipulation and you know understand that they have different world's views. So the first difference uh, is that the Sunni uh, belief, which is our belief, you're asking us, you're asking me, and I am from the Sunni belief. The Sunnis are called Sunnis because they believe in the Quran and in the Sunnah. Sunni means they believe in the Sunnah. Everybody believes in the Quran. So what makes the Sunni people different is that they believe in the Quran and in the Sunnah. What is the Sunnah? The Sunnah is the life and teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as recorded in the famous books of Hadith. So for us, the primary source of revelation, of inspiration, of ethics, of laws, of theology, of morality, where do we turn back to? We turn back to the Quran and the Sunnah. The other group, the Shia group, uh, they it is short for Shia to uh, Ali radiallahu an, or the partisans or the people who follow Ali radiallahu an. That uh, for them, uh, the primary source is the Quran, and then a living descendant of Ali radiallahu an, whom they call an Imam. So there is an authority 
There is a person whom uh, they consider to be the final arbiter, the one who speaks essentially on behalf of the religion. And this person is the one who can decide, who can uh, legislate and interpret the Quran. This is the person who can have the final say uh, in what is to be correct and not correct. And this is a person whom they call the Imam. So this leads us to the second point. And that is that the Quran and Sunnah are of course uh, revelations and books. And so for Sunni Muslims, we believe that scholars are human beings who are trained to study those books and then interpret the books. There is no one scholar who is appointed by Allah to speak on behalf of the texts. There is no one person who is absolutely 100% correct. Rather, the collective group of scholarship and especially the unanimous consensus of the scholars is what is binding and correct. There is no single individual authorized by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or authorized by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to interpret the faith. This is the belief of, our, of uh, Sunnis, which is us. The Shia, as we said, believe in, in something called the Imam. And so they believe that there must always be one person that the world must have always one person who is divinely appointed and who has the ultimate and final right to interpret the faith. Hence, for the Sunnis, no human being alive is infallible, 100% correct. Whereas for the Shia, the, there is somebody who is infallible and that is the Imam. This leads us to the third point, And that is that for Sunnis, leadership of the community is a political reality, not a religious one. And hence, whoever leads the community, they don't interpret the Quran or the Sunnah in any extra authority. If they're not trained, they don't interpret at all. The political leader is not something that is dictated by the Quran and Sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ didn't say so and so should be the leader. And the leader can be chosen by the people. And that leader can be good, that leader can be bad. Historically, the Sunnis believe some of our leaders were great and some of them were not so great. Leadership of the community is not a divinely appointed status. That the revelation came down to a sign. As for the Shia community, they believe that the default is that the leadership is a religious office and that the one who is the political leader should also be the religious leader and that person is appointed by God. That person is the one that Allah wanted to be the leader by name. So there is an element of concentration of power, if you like, uh, in one person for the Shia community. That one person, of course, is the Imam. That Imam should be the political and the religious authority. And that person should be the one in charge of the affairs of the community and in charge of the interpretation of the texts. And therefore, he is appointed by God himself or by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of course, as for the Sunnis, we do not believe this is the case. And so leadership, generally speaking, in the political field is not something that, uh, uh, generally speaking, it's uh, uh, good and bad, no big deal. It is the religious leadership that is different general again this is generally sometimes you'll have a scholar in the in the political uh, class such as in the first few generations Abu Bakr Umar Uthman uh, Ali radiallahu anhum they were scholars and they were also political leaders but historically the political leadership has been distinct from the religious leadership and historically the political leadership has not interpreted the texts they're simply in charge of the affairs of the um, ummah and religious clergy are not appointed by Allah. Anybody can train and become a clergy. Anybody can train and study the text. And then once they're qualified, they give an opinion and no one individual is divinely appointed. So this is another fundamental difference between Sunnis and between Shias. Point number four, based upon this reality, the Shia believe that from the very beginning of Islam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanted his cousin and his son-in-law, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala an, to be the leader, the Imam after him. They believe this to be clear from the entirety of the seerah. Every incident involving, involving Ali radiallahu an for them illustrates and demonstrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam explicitly appointed 
Ali radiallahu an to be not just the political leader, but as we said, the religious leader, the Imam after him. For the Sunnis, uh, the Prophet ﷺ did not appoint any such leader. And much of these incidents regarding Ali radiallahu an, the Sunnis also acknowledge and affirm, but they don't interpret them the way that the Shia interpret them. They don't view that the Prophet ﷺ praising Ali radiallahu an indicates he's going to be uh, the Imam or the person in charge. They simply say that was praised for him, just like the Prophet ﷺ praised other companions as well. And in fact, Sunnis believe, if anything, uh, when the Prophet ﷺ was passing away, uh, about to pass away, when he's on his deathbed, the fact that he insisted on Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an to lead the salah when he has only a few days left to live. And Abu Bakr as-Siddiq was the one who led the salah radiallahu an for a number of days, indicates, if anything, that he wanted to give political leadership. Political leadership, but he did not say so. It is an indication, it is an assumption. As for the Shia, they say it was explicit, not just an assumption, that the Prophet ﷺ explicitly mandated, and he explicitly said that Ali radiallahu an should be not just the political leader, but the Imam and the religious uh, authority after he passed away. So this is another fundamental difference between uh, the Sunni and the Shia understandings. Point number five, the issue of the uh, family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Ahl al-Bayt or the Al al-Bayt, that uh, for the Sunnis, it is indeed a blessing to be a part of the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to be biologically related to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, that blessing only comes when that individual himself or herself is also pious and righteous merely being related by blood while the person himself is not righteous or pious is not going to help. The Prophet's uncle himself is Abu Lahab. And Abu Lahab, we know what his fate is by the testimony of the Quran. Simply having a biological connection does not in and of itself make a person blessed. However, if a person is good and has taqwa and does good deeds and is also from the family of the Prophet wasallam, this is indeed a double blessing. And for the Sunnis, the companions uh, have multiple types of blessings. There are blessings for those who embraced Islam very early on. There are blessings for those who did both of the hijras to Abyssinia and to Medina. There are blessings for those who did one hijrah to Medina. There are blessings for those who participate in the Battle of Badr. And to be a member of the Prophet's household, it's also a blessing. There's no supernatural powers that come. It's just a generic blessing that can also be given like so many other blessings. As for the uh, Shia, then the superiority of the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the blessings of that family becomes a, in, a, an integral point of theology. And they view the Al al-Bayt uh, in a light that uh, uh, is more than what the Sunnis view. The Sunnis, as we said, view the Al al-Bayt with a blessing if they themselves are pious. But that blessing does not mean that they have extra powers or that they have supernatural powers or that they are in any way, fashion or form meant to be uh, the arbiters of the faith or to be the political leaders of the faith. It is simply a blessed family. And we ask Allah to bless the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As for the Shia, then the blessings of the Al al-Bayt become second only to the Quran itself. And so because the Imams themselves come from the Al al-Bayt, and so for them the Quran and then the Al al-Bayt and the Imams that come from them are really the two most important uh, uh, sources, if you like, of interpretation and Islamic law. This leads us to the sixth point, that uh, the Shia believe that this Imam must be from the progeny of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the Al al-Bayt. The Sunnis, of course, don't have any such equivalent. As we said, they don't really believe in a figure uh, that is the final arbiter. Now, uh, here we have to go a little bit technical. Our brother says that he knows there's a, a, a Shi'i mosque in his vicinity. Uh, it's clear, therefore, that he is not aware that there are even multiple strands of Sunnis and multiple strands of Shi'a. So Sunnis and Shi'a, uh, just FYI, statistically, there's probably around 85 to 90% of the Muslim world is Sunni and probably around 10 to 12% uh, 
uh, of the uh, uh, world is Shi'i. And within Shi'ism, you have multiple strands. And within Sunnism, you also have multiple uh, strands. But of course, uh, generally speaking, within Sunnism, the strands generally, they don't have different mosques and whatnot. Uh, within Shi'ism, uh, there are multiple strands depending on which Imam they follow. So the majority of the Shia of the world today, uh, the Shia of, let's say, the, in Iran and Iraq and in Lebanon, these are like the, the you know, the common well-known Shia branches. They follow what is known the, as Twelver Shi'ism. Twelver Shi'ism. So they believe in the existence of exactly 12 Imams. And this is the default. When somebody says there are Shia, the default is there are Twelver Shia. You should know that there are other smaller segments as well. There's something called the Fiverr or the Zaydi Shia, and they are common in one part of Yemen, in southern Yemen. Uh, there's also Sevener or Ismaili Shia, and they have small branches and pockets. You have the uh, the Bohra, and you have the uh, um, uh, the Nizari Ismaili Aga Khanis. You have multiple strands within, and they are relatively quite uh, small, the Sevener uh, Shia, in terms of, of numbers. So the default is that you're talking about Twelver Shiism. And we'll talk about the entire talk today is about Twelver Shiism. Uh, we're not going into the differences between between uh, the other strands of Shias, and maybe another day we will do that. So we said that the Shia believe in Imams from the Ahl al-Bayt, 12 Shia, which is the default, believe in exactly 12 Imams. They believe in exactly 12 Imams. And these Imams are all from the descendants of, uh, from the Al al-Bayt, uh, the descendants of Ali radiallahu an and Fatima radiallahu anha. And other groups of Shia have other strands and other linkages that we're not going to go into. Our next point is that we talked about Twelver Shia, and one of the key beliefs of Twelver Shia is that every single Imam assigns and delegates from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala the name of the next Imam. So every Imam authorizes the next Imam. It's a continuous chain, and this is known as Nas. Nas means that every Imam has to verify and assign, pass the baton down to the next Imam. The first Imam, according to the Shia, was appointed by the Prophet and that is Ali radiallahu anh. After him came his two sons, Hassan and then Hussein radiallahu anhum. And then that's the second and third Imam. And then from Hussein radiallahu anh, it is father, son, father, son, father, son, all the way down to the 12th Imam, okay? So you have father, son throughout the entire chain, except for the second and third, they are two brothers, Hassan and Hussein radiallahu anhum, the grandsons of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So this is 12 Shiism. As we said, there are other strands, and they basically break away from this 12 at various places. Some break away at the fifth, so they're called the Zaydis, the fifth fivers. Some break away at the seventh, they're called Ismailis, because the seventh was Ismail. So they have different strands uh, amongst themselves, but the bulk or the predominant strand is uh, 12 uh, Shi uh, Shi'ism. And for 12 Shiites, these 12 Imams are infallible they cannot commit a mistake. And when they speak, they speak essentially on behalf of God. They cannot commit a mistake. That's what makes them an Imam. For the Sunnis, all of these Imams are fallible human beings and they are not appointed by Allah to be the final arbiters. It's not something that, um, uh, that uh, Sunnis believe. Uh, interestingly, the Sunnis respect immensely uh, Ali radiallahu an and Hassan and Hussein radiallahu anhum as being of the Ahl al-Bayt. And they also respect especially, uh, you know, the first uh, uh, two or three Imams after. Uh, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq has given a lot of respect in Sunni circles as a great scholar, as an alim, as a faqih, as a teacher of so many other uh, great scholars of Islam. But they don't view them as being infallible. They don't view them as being divinely appointed. And by the way, interestingly enough, from the Sunni perspective, these individuals, Ali radiallahu anh, Hassan and Hussein radiallahu anhum, and the rest of the early Imams did not claim to be Imams. They did not, this is the Sunni perspective, obviously. They did not claim that they were divinely appointed by God. They did not claim that they were infallible. This is something that Sunnis do not believe even they claimed. Of course, uh, the Shia believe that they claim this and they are deserving of this. But you should know that 
uh, the Sunnis respect immensely, uh, especially the first uh, few Imams as historical figures, as, as embodiments of piety, as receptacles of knowledge. And uh, their biographies are found in Sunni literature. And their name occurs constantly in the Sunni books of history and hadith with a lot of veneration and respect, but there's no uh, special powers given, or there's no extra status given to them uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, the Shia give. So that is a historic difference uh, between, uh, between the two. This leads us to our next point, And I'm sure by now you, you're thinking about the question, well, if there's only 12 Imams, and the world must have an Imam, well then where is the Imam? Where is the 12th Imam right now? And this is a very, very good question. So of course, for the Sunnis, there is no concept of a divinely appointed Imam. As you're aware, we call any person of knowledge Imam, okay? I'm called Imam in my masjid sometimes, and even though there's an official Imam title, but sometimes just they just call me Imam. So for us, an Imam is not um, a divinely appointed office. I mean, anybody can be the Imam. Uh, and for the Shia, as we said, the Imam is one figure appointed by Allah with certain characteristics and certain attributes that the rest of us do not have. Most importantly, infallibility, and then also a knowledge of things that we do not have a knowledge of, and then also God-given powers that we do not have. So this is the infallible um, Imam. Now the question arises, where is the Imam for 12 Rishia? So by the way, you should know that both um, the five Rizaydis and also um, the, the Ismaili Nizaris, uh, they have Imams that they recognize and are alive and they can interact with them. Um, that's different strands of Shi'ism. As for 12 Rishiism, they have a belief that the 12th Imam went into hiding. This was uh, almost a thousand years ago, almost a thousand years ago, roughly, I mean, just to be simplistic, that a long time ago, they believed the 12th Imam went into hiding called Ghaybah. And currently, he is on earth, but nobody knows where he is. He is in hiding. He can appear whenever he wants to appear. He can help whomever he wants to help. But there is nobody that is in contact with the Imam right now. And this is called Ghaybah. This is called the, the, the great hiding, if you like. And he has chosen to do so. This is the, the Shi'i belief. And they believe that towards the end of time, the Imam shall return publicly. This is called the Raj'ah. He's gonna come back publicly. He's going to proclaim himself as the final Imam, as the 12th Imam, as the hidden Mahdi, and that will signal the beginning of the end of the Day of Judgment. That's when it's all going to start coming to an end, and the end of the Day of Judgment will uh, come at that time, and the Mahdi, the 12th Imam, will come back, the return of the Imam will come, and that will bring in an era of peace and an era of harmony, and the enemies of Islam will all be destroyed at the hands of the Imam. So this is what the, uh, the, the Twelver Shia believe, that the Twelfth Imam is currently in hiding and that he shall return towards the end of times. As for uh, the Sunnis, they do not believe in any uh, hidden Imam in the first place, and so they don't have any equivalent of this uh, belief. However, uh, Sunnis do believe that uh, uh, there shall be a figure towards the end of times uh, that is called the Mahdi. And this Mahdi, they assign no supernatural powers, not infallibility, simply a good man who will come and unite the Ummah and help the world in a very difficult uh, time and bring about uh, the, the precursor to the coming of Jesus Christ. So uh, there are some parallels between Sunnis and Shia about the Mahdi, but there's marked differences as well. The main difference is that for the Sunnis, the Mahdi shall be born a normal birth, he's not gonna be infallible, he's going to be a leader for his time and his people, and then he's gonna pass away. And for the 12 or Shia, the Mahdi is alive right now, but he's in hiding and he is the 12th Imam. And when he comes back, he, uh, well, and he has powers that nobody else has, and he is infallible, and he has power to do things and cause damage and whatnot, and uh, Allah has given him these, the, these, these powers, but he has chosen to uh, be hidden until the time comes uh, towards the end of this world to return. And so uh, when that happens, then the end of time shall be signaled in. So there's, as we said, some similarities and some uh, differences between the Sunni and the Shia belief. This leads us to uh, uh, point number uh, nine in our 10 point list. And uh, very briefly, this is a very small point, not a very big deal. You should be aware that there are some differences in how the rituals are practiced 
and some legal differences between the two schools. So for example, you know, the peculiarities of the prayer, how exactly does one pray? Just like we have differences in Sunni Islam between the four madhabs, so too in Shia Islam, they have a slightly different way of how they pray. Uh, they have different rulings for combining the prayers than us. Uh, they have different timings for breaking the fast. So for us, we break the fast with the Adhan of Maghrib. And for them, they break the fast, you know, after they pray Maghrib, after a little bit after the sunset. So there's a bit of a delay uh, between us and them when it comes to breaking uh, the fast. As well, uh, they have a ritual, uh, they have um, uh, uh, specific rituals that they do on the 10th of Muharram, uh, the day of Ashura. Uh, to them, the day of Ashura becomes a day uh, of commemoration. It is a holy day for them. It is a holy festival for them in which uh, they uh, commemorate uh, the death or the assassination or the martyrdom of Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who was martyred on that day. And that day uh, becomes really the center of the year for them in terms of uh, rehashing the, 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 the rituals, the teachings, uh, the theology, and also the events uh, of the martyrdom. Uh, as for us, the 10th of Muharram, uh, the, the, the incident of Karbala, the martyrdom of the Prophet it is a historical tragedy. It is not a theological one, meaning that we don't base any theology off of it. And I have an entire lecture online, by the way, you can listen to it about uh, the incident of Karbala and how it has been interpreted by Sunni and by Shia. And it is a very lengthy lecture and you can listen to it for an understanding of what uh, of what uh, the difference is is uh, between our interpretation and their interpretation of the issue of Karbala and of the martyrdom of Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Uh, both Sunni and Shia, they view the tragedy of the death of Hussein with a great sadness. And they say, whoever did this tragedy uh, is somebody who is deserving of punishment. And they say that this is an evil crime that took place. But then for the Sunnis, it is a historical crime and the religion does not change. And for the Shia, uh, they see a lot of theology and they see in it uh, a, a motif of their faith tradition of, uh, of uh, fighting against oppression and of dying, uh, you know, a, a, a martyr's death. And the death of Hussein symbolizes for them uh, many things. And you can listen to other lectures and the lecture I have given as well uh, to get an idea of this. But my point being, this is one of the differences as well. And that is the commemorations that take place uh, on the 10th of uh, Muharram. It is a ritual uh, for the Shia and for the Sunnis. Um, if anything, we fast on that day because our Prophet told us to do so, but there's no festival that takes place uh, that is equivalent. And the final point, which I have saved for the last, because it is uh, the most difficult one, and it is the most contentious one. And it is one, the one that causes the most uh, hurt feelings, and at times, unfortunately, even leads to violence. And that is the one of the fundamental differences between the Sunni and the Shia groups, is how they view the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's because if you've been following along carefully, I hope I haven't confused you with all of these, uh, this uh, theology, to believe that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam assigned Ali radiallahu anhu to be the leader. And then to realize that he wasn't chosen, that he was passed over, that he was neglected and ignored, obviously, if you believe this, then you will view those who jumped over him with a negative view. You will be angry with those whom you think disobeyed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And because of this, the Shia are not very favorable in how they view those Sahaba, especially the senior Sahaba in the eyes of the Sunnis, uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, and also for example our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, that they don't view these senior uh, Sahaba with a positive view. In fact, it is true to point out that historically and especially uh, key uh, Shiite clergy in the past were extremely harsh. Uh, towards these individuals. And even many of them would claim that they are not actually Muslims, that they are hypocrites, not actual faithful Muslims. And of course, 
um, this claim is extremely painful and hurtful for those who view these companions as being the embodiments of virtue and the paragons of uh, piety. And obviously, this is where you know you have different versions of history. So it is important, my dear brother, that you understand how you view early history and your narrative of early Islam is going to be based upon your sources and your sources are gonna be based upon which sect you are following. So the books of history of the Shia present a narrative that is markedly different than the books of history of the Sunnis. And this is not the time and the place to compare the specific details and to mention you know, which one is right and wrong. This is something that you will have to decide on your own when you grow up and whatnot. Obviously, you know what I believe because I am a Sunni. So my belief is very clear in this regard. But I'm simply at this point being academic and explaining that each side is taught a narrative of history that fits in with their theology. And I'm not saying that that's both right and wrong. Obviously, they both can't be right. Obviously, one of them is right, one of them is wrong. Obviously, you can't have it both ways. So if you believe that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu, the senior companions knew that Ali radiallahu anhu was supposed to be the Khalifa and they all united to kick him out, how would you feel about that? you would feel a great injustice has occurred. You would feel angry towards this group of Sahaba. You might even feel as some of the, the clergy do of that, of that group, that they're not Muslims having gone against such a key commandment. And by the way, many later voices in Shia Islam are not saying that they're not Muslim. They're simply toning down and they're saying that, you know, they made a mistake. And so there's within themselves, there's a bit of a, uh, you know, spectrum of opinion of how this group is interpreted, but to be factual, they are not viewed with respect. That's, that's very clear to say. They are not viewed favorably. And obviously, a picture is painted of a type of battle between these individuals and Ali radiallahu anhu. Stories are said that Sunnis have never heard, would never believe Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu physically yani, hitting the daughter of the Prophet or trying to burn her house down. These are stories that are told by one branch and believed by one branch and not even known, much less accepted. No Sunni would ever believe that Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was disrespectful to the daughter of the Prophet. We don't have this. We don't believe this at all. It's not for, from our perspective. But obviously, if you are taught to this narrative, how would you feel about anybody who disrespected the daughter of the Prophet You would not like that person. Well, that is how many of the Shia feel about these senior companions. And this is the perhaps most emotional uh, point of contention. Uh, you know, because you know, believing in an Imam and whatnot, these are, this is a big theological difference, no, no point, no, no question about that. But it doesn't offend the sensibilities of the average Muslim. But when you say bad things about Abu Bakr Umar radiallahu anhu, or about Aisha radiallahu anha, understandably the average Muslim is very hurt and that's why even amongst the Shia there's a lot of discussion about rethinking through, toning down, there are a number of modern ayatollahs have issued fatwas that uh, that the, these sahaba should not be disrespected and I appreciate that effort and I encourage that effort uh, amongst uh, uh, the, the Shia. Now these are some of the main differences. Before we conclude, uh, let us also point out that you know what, Yes, there's some significant differences, but in the end of the day, both of these groups say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Both of these groups believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the one and only Rabb. Both of these groups believe in the Quran as the speech of Allah and revelation from Allah. Both of these groups believe in the finality of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that he was rahmat lil alameen. Both of these groups pray facing the Qibla, doing wudu, bowing their heads to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Both of these groups fast Ramadan. Both of these groups give charity. Both of these groups go for Hajj. So the five arkan of Islam are all met on both of these groups. So yes, there are some key fundamental differences. And it is also true to state that some of these differences are painful. But in the end of the day, what we agree upon are bigger fundamentals. And they are the primary fundamentals of our faith. So what is to be done then? Well, you have some people who wish to make this difference bigger than it is. And they're always fomenting hatred and speaking against the other group and, and yelling and screaming about how nasty the other group is. And sometimes that type of rhetoric has led to violence in some lands, civil wars in some lands. And that's not right. 
We don't want violence. We don't want to hurt, physically hurt other people because they believe in something, even if we don't agree with what they believe. It's between them and Allah. They have to respond to Allah. We don't want to preach violence and we have to speak out against violence. It's not allowed to hurt a human being because of a belief that he or she has. That's between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah allowed the Ahli Kitab, you know, the, the non-Muslim to hold in their beliefs, then how much more so about a fellow Muslim, even if we disagree. So that's one extreme. On the flip side, you have another group of people that basically says, oh, there is no difference between the two of us and we are both one and the same. But see, even though the sentiment might be good, that's just not true. We are not one and the same. There are some key fundamental differences. So what should we do? For this purpose of this q and I'll conclude on this note, that my view has been one of pragmatic tolerance. Pragmatic tolerance. We have no option but to live and let live. But we have to also be factually clear that the differences between us, while pragmatically tolerable, and while still within the fold of Islam, without preaching any hatred, we really must say that the differences are significant. It's not trivial to believe whether Allah has chosen a person or not to be the Imam for the entire Ummah. It's a big deal. It's something you have to come to the conclusion and, and then decide. It's not a trivial thing to say Abu Bakr as-Siddiq is a good or a bad person or Umar al-Khattab radiallahu It's a very big thing. So to have two different masjids in your community, you have to understand why that is the case. That it is healthier for each community to be amongst its own. But we should not preach a hatred or exacerbate the division. And by the way, just because there's another masjid, I'm not saying never ever pray there. If that's the place you're driving by, it's closer to, you know, uh, the, the last time is going, you have nowhere else to pray. You know, you go and you pray. There's a masjid in the end of the day, it's facing the qibla, it's worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the same time, understand that there is a pragmatic wisdom that, you know, the, the, the understanding that is being taught is different. And so it's healthy that they are able to express, we're able to express that we preach and teach our theologies, but I strongly encourage both groups, I strongly encourage that they do not exacerbate the tension, live and let live. And also we need to learn to come together when the situation calls for it. I'm not saying that we pray one Jumu'ah together, understandably what we preach is gonna be slightly different, but I am saying we should not preach hatred. I am saying we should marginalize the radical clerics who are only interested in division and hatred and animosity because we have clerics, both of us, that are like that. We should move them to the fringes and we should promote clerics who are pragmatic and understand, you know what, these differences are not gonna go away. We have to live and let live. And I go beyond this and I say, not only is there no problem, we should come together with all strands of Islam to fight our bigger battles. There are times and places where we set our differences aside and there are times and places where we acknowledge those differences. So there's an evil politician in your community. There's a person running for the minister, the senator, the congresswoman, uh, and she is an Islamophobe or he is somebody who wants to ban the building of Masajid. How can we not unite with all different Muslims? How can we not rally and petition? How can we not come together and pool our resources and vote that evil person out? This is the essence of Islam. And if we have to cooperate with anybody, even a non-Muslim who agrees with our values, we will cooperate with them, no problem. Our difference of opinion should not lead us to be so blind to the hatred that we can never come together for the common good. If there is a charity feeding the hungry and we're limited in the community, why can't different masajid of different groups come together and we say this is a public soup kitchen for Muslims uh, on behalf of the Muslims for all of the poor of the area. This is excellent cooperation, but understandably, if a critical mass is reached and every group is able to have its own masjid, understandably, understand there's nothing wrong with this and there's an element of healthy you know, uh, separation that inshallah there's something we understand that uh, there's good in this as well. And uh, in the end of the day, um, our preaching and teaching should be pragmatic and full of wisdom and be factually correct. We're not going to eliminate these differences, but we shouldn't exacerbate them. And we should work together where we're able to work together and agree uh, with uh, practical, uh, agree to disagree with a practical understanding that 
you know, they have their interpretation, we have our interpretation. This is a very basic answer, dear brother Sajid. I hope that it was useful to you. And if you're interested in more advanced uh, study, then of course there are so many books, so many lectures uh, to listen to. Uh, but I advise you to listen to those that are academic based, those that state the, the facts in a truthful manner and not based upon emotional sectarianism. And the final point, always make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you and that you'll be a role model and a beacon of truth and of virtue and of tolerance. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all to, to the truth. I hope inshallah to see you next week. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. إن المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات والقانتين والقانتات والصادقين والصادقات والصابرين والصابرات والخاشعين والخاشعات والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما